We have uh, good news to talk about today with a wrap up of the legislative session. But I wanted to start by commenting on the horrific act of domestic terrorism in Buffalo over the weekend. This is a stark reminder that the embers of hate and white supremacy are still flaring up, and that it's on all of us to extinguish those embers when we see them and find ways to stop these horrible acts from happening in the first place. It's important for all Vermonters to recognize there's still work that needs to be done, and also know that many Vermonters of color could use our support and extra kindness right now. Next, I thought I'd spend some time today talking about the legislative session. In particular, some of the investments that will be made with historic state surpluses and federal funding. I know you've heard me talk a lot over the last year about how we can't squander this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity and about how to make the most impactful, transformative investments that will get us the best return on investment for years to come. As I said in my adjournment address to the legislature, it's the areas of disagreement that get most of the attention at the end of the session. But in the end, by working together, we really did accomplish a lot. Last year, when we learned about how much we'd get through ARPA funding, I laid out a vision with five buckets I felt would best serve Vermonters. $250 million for housing. Over $200 million to combat climate change. $200 million for water, sewer, and stormwater infrastructure. $250 million for broadband. And over $170 million for economic development. As you may recall, as part of our negotiations last year, I insisted the budget include intent language that in principle committed additional money to these buckets again this year so we could follow through on what we started. And I'm pleased the legislature largely stuck to this agreement. For example, in this year's budget, the legislature funded the second half of the $250 million broadband request which will provide the vast majority of Vermonters with internet access. I also requested historic funding for climate change mitigation. And this year they funded my $80 million request for weatherization, $10 million for EV infrastructure, $14 million for clean vehicle incentives, millions for grid upgrades, home electric systems, and much, much more. We'll also invest another $100 million plus in water, sewer, and stormwater infrastructure, which will give communities across the state more opportunity to grow and thrive. And even though there were some debates about issues attached to the housing bills, we worked out many of our differences. And we'll be investing hundreds of millions to build new homes, help those experiencing homelessness, and make it easier to build in places we want development like downtowns and village centers. Now, I didn't get everything I wanted and never do. And as a reminder, the legislature vetoed their fair share of my proposals as well. But in the areas I just discussed, Vermonters will benefit for decades to come as a result of the decisions we made this year. There will be more time in the weeks ahead to talk about all the good in many of these bills and those who deserve credit especially as we start receiving them from the legislature to sign. And I look forward to seeing shovels in the ground across the state this summer. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine. <clears throat> Thank you, Governor. Uh, before I get into my remarks, which will span therapeutics, surveillance report, testing, and infant formula. I want to first acknowledge the tragic milestone that the U.S. has reached. One million people have died due to COVID-19. It's truly staggering to contemplate that many lives taken by the virus and the even higher number of people who bear the grief, their lives forever changed by the loss of a loved one. We should take a moment to remember the now 654 lives lost here in Vermont. Even if we did not know them personally, each one was a family member, friend, and neighbor who mattered and who can never be replaced. 
So my first update is on Paxlovid. We've been telling Vermonters regularly about this very effective antiviral pill for those at higher risk for COVID-19. On Friday, we reached out to the healthcare system and uh, through our health alert network to help decrease any barriers to getting this treatment to Vermonters. We provided user-friendly tools to help in the decision-making process. We encourage clinicians to prescribe, even if symptoms are mild, to prevent the symptoms from potentially worsening later in the course of the illness. We also suggest they have a triage system in place within their office so these patients can get the medication as quickly as possible. Now, while vaccination does prevent serious outcomes, some people also do need an antiviral to keep them out of the hospital. And those are, of course, people who are older or have certain medical conditions. So I ask them to not assume that their case will be mild or that mild symptoms mean you shouldn't seek treatment. You just don't know how things are going to progress. And don't think you're saving this valuable and highly effective treatment for someone who may be more needy because we currently have a plentiful supply through the state. In fact, we just received 4,000 treatment courses this week. So please be on the safe side and reach out to your health care provider if you test positive. Our new weekly COVID-19 surveillance report was published last week. And as I previewed a week ago, this report presents the most valuable data we're using to monitor COVID-19 in Vermont now and moving forward. It shows trends in who is coming to the emergency room with COVID-like illness, an important indicator of virus activity as case counts are no longer reliable. It still includes case trends though, impact on hospitals, numbers of outbreaks, and vaccination rates. And there's also information on wastewater monitoring and the proportions of variants over time. You can see at a glance the statewide risk level at the top of the report. As I said previously at this point in the pandemic, you really should not be basing your decision on daily fluctuations in case numbers. The statewide risk level is the most important piece of information needed to make decisions about taking prevention steps based on your own risk assessment, personal circumstances, and risk tolerance. And a reminder that this case dashboard will no longer be updated after tomorrow. The vaccine dashboard, however, will still be available. We will also begin to sunset other individual weekly reports as the relevant information is already included in the surveillance report. These will include self-reported test results, the long-term care facilities report, the pediatric case report, and the weekly data summary. Our teams will continue to collect, analyze, and respond to data in real time. They've managed a huge volume of information and produced various reports throughout the pandemic, and we would not have been able to respond without them. I also want to thank Vermonters for paying close attention to this data. Adapting to these changes will be a transition, but we continue to evolve, learn, and use the most effective tools to keep everyone safe. Moving to testing. As we move out of the emergency phase of the pandemic and incorporate our COVID work into the regular day-to-day -day public health work, we continue to evaluate how we can make sure our efforts to protect Vermonters are sustainable and shared across existing systems of care. You've already seen changes concerning vaccination. After our highly successful efforts to vaccinate Vermonters through large-scale clinics, vaccination is now returned to its traditional home at medical providers' offices and at pharmacies. Our next step will be a similar transition for our testing infrastructure, shifting COVID testing from a state-run system to the healthcare system and pharmacies. Now, our testing efforts in Vermont have been nothing short of incredible throughout the pandemic. From the early days of collaborating with the National Guard for pop-up PCR testing that was sent to the health department lab, to setting up, setting up statewide sites through our contractor and sending specimens to outside labs, 
to bringing on healthcare partners to run joint COVID testing and vaccine centers, and finally, in our most recent phase, distributing home take-home tests. We're seeing that demand for PCR testing is slowing as at-home tests are more convenient and give you quicker results. At-home tests are widely available and a critical tool as we deal with an increasingly transmissible version of the virus. Pharmacies have come on board with various testing options on site, and providers can still assess symptomatic patients for testing as well. Remember, our public health recommendations are very focused on who really needs to test now. And those are people with symptoms or close contacts who are not up to date on their vaccinations. This is the most effective way to lower the chances of virus spread, so those who need to isolate can do so. Testing is also critical to getting connected to treatment quickly, as we've talked about previously, if you're at higher risk of COVID. So three options, at-home tests, pharmacy testing, and healthcare provider testing, will continue to meet all of our testing needs. And with these positive developments, public test sites are planned to close in a phased manner through the month of May and most of June. We are fortunate that home testing supplies are widely available, and we are committed to this remaining as convenient and free as it is now. We'll make sure people have ready access to what they need, since that's the best first option if you develop any symptoms. So you can order a free third round of tests from the federal government, eight tests per order, at covid.gov. You can also make an appointment here in Vermont to pick up tests at a state-run site through the end of June. And for that, you go to healthvermont.gov slash testing. Finally, I'd like to address formula and some of the anxiety that some are feeling about the shortage. The U.S. Department of Agriculture and the FDA are taking steps to address these shortages, and with recent news from the FDA and Abbott Laboratories about reopening the closed manufacturing plant, we're hopeful supply to Vermont will increase, but we know that will take weeks to several months. Currently, the situation I understand is frustrating for many parents and caregivers. The Health Department, including our WIC Women, Infants, and Children program, and local health offices is working to support families in keeping babies well-fed with appropriate substitutes and recommendations. In addition, the Agency of Agriculture, Food, and Markets have been reaching out to local grocers and retailers. Everyone should be aware that small stores and some pharmacies may have adequate formula supplies if they can't find it in some of the larger supermarkets they're searching in. Critical to the safety of babies, I do want to share some important cautions for people who are responsible for their feeding. First, families should not substitute goat's milk, cow's milk, or plant-based milk for, instant, for infant formula. Second, most important, do not water down the formula you do have. Third, as a general rule, don't make homemade formula. And last, pay close attention to the online retailers of infant formula to ensure they are legitimate and safe sources. Order only from well-recognized distributors and pharmacies. Anyone with questions about formula options should be in contact with their pediatrician's office. You can ask if they have in-office samples or can suggest a similar, a similar formula appropriate for their particular infant's needs. And in addition to all this, for those who are expecting a baby soon, those are encouraged to consult with a provider about breastfeeding their infant. Our Vermont WIC program provides breastfeeding support and resources to new families. You can find more information at healthvermont.gov slash WIC. I'll turn it back to the governor now. Thank you, Dr. Levine. And uh, we'll now open up to questions. Starting with folks in the room. Governor, your decision to uh, seek re-election, how, how did you arrive at, at this, this juncture, and when did you 
Yeah, you know, I carefully considered um, my options. Uh, it's been a long six years, but at the same time, um, understanding what we're faced with today, we've made some historic investments, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, in investments that I think will give us a high return on the investments. We have to follow through on them, and uh, we need a seasoned, seasoned team in order to do that, and that's what we provide. Uh, it doesn't isn't just me. It's many of the uh, commissioners and, and secretaries that, uh, that are part of our team that will carry the load. As well, I'm worried about uh, inflation and a possible recession as a result of the inflation. And, uh, and again, I think we need a seasoned team uh, to, to get us through that and help us through that. So um, I decided to, uh, to move forward with another two years and um, look forward to the opportunity to do that if, uh, if voters will have me. Will you be actively fundraising like in the years past, or is it going to be similar to, to 2020 when you, you weren't actively fundraising the campaign? Right. I, I, we want to continue uh, to do the work at hand right now uh, and put all these measures into place, put the funding into place, and uh, follow through on our commitments throughout the legislative session. Um, so I would say uh, any campaigning would happen after Labor Day. Governor Scott, only one other candidate has entered the race thus far. What kind of race are you anticipating or preparing for? Um, as I've done in the past, um, I typically talk about what I can bring to the table, what I can accomplish, what I think I can do. I don't talk about other candidates uh, who are in the race. Uh, we still have a number of days to go. We'll see uh, who else surfaces. I've, um, I don't believe I've ever had a race uh, throughout my political life where I haven't had a primary. So I'm still, you know, expecting someone to, to surface uh, to challenge for the primary. So we'll see what happens, but uh, um, we'll learn a lot more over the next couple of weeks. You've said you won't debate, won't start campaigning until after Labor Day. If you do get a primary opponent, will you... Uh, We'll see, you know, we'll see if there's a legitimate uh, candidate that surfaces that might be different. And do you have a uh, litmus test for what defines a legitimate candidate? No. Governor, what did you say that you, you know, realized you wanted to run for re-election? Is it something you knew several months ago or just something that you, you knew just several weeks ago you, you decided? No, I mean, we, I really was focused on the legislative session. And uh, and throughout, I didn't know how long it was going to go. I mean, look back even just a week ago. I wasn't sure whether it was going to end last week or not uh, and whether we would be able to accomplish everything that we had hoped to accomplish. Um, again, um, having gotten through that last week um, brought me to the realization that I had to make a decision, obviously. And, uh, and I think it's best uh, to put a team in place that can carry this load that is here. And, and again, I'm concerned about, I've been concerned about inflation uh, for the last six months. Um, and I'm concerned about the impact that has on everyday Vermonters and the recession that could come as a result. So having this team, uh, this talented team that, I, that I'm so blessed to have uh, there to, to move forward I think is important. And Governor, if you are really for Governor, I guess what are some goals that you would have for you and your team uh, moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I mean it, it, what you see is what you get. Um, some of the same concerns I had five or six years ago are still here today. Our demographics being one, uh, trying to grow the economy, make Vermont more affordable, or more tax relief. I mean, they're all the same. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't accomplished all we hope to, um, but there's still uh, time left in the game, so to speak. Have you had any conversations with anybody at the RGA about this decision? I have not. We're set to see a lot of turnover in executive offices and in the legislature. Did that factor into your decision? Well, in the executive offices, that's somewhat normal. I mean, we see that, um, you know, these are tough positions. Uh, they require a lot of dedication, a lot of work. And uh, so we, we see that uh, um, turnover, so to speak. Um, in terms of the legislature, I'm, uh, I'm actually surprised at the amount of turnover. I was not expecting to see 
at last count, 11 out of the Senate. That's over a third. Uh, that's significant. And uh, many of those uh, who are not seeking re-election in the House uh, as well are committee chairs. So this is a this is going to be a sea change in many respects uh, in terms of institutional knowledge and uh, some of the expertise they bring with them. I, I offer my thanks uh, for all their years of work and uh, sorry to see uh, many of them go. It sounds like that concerns you. I mean, it is a concern when so many leave at the same time. And, um, and again, uh, when you think about this, it may not be over. I don't know who else is running in the Senate, but 11 confirmed not running. That's significant. A lot of these folks are people with whom you served when you were in the legislature. To what extent do you lose some of your ability to cooperate and collaborate when these faces aren't as familiar as the Yeah, it's, it's just a, a, dip, a different atmosphere. Um, obviously, uh, we'll have to establish relationships with whoever is elected. Um, but, um, but as you said, I served with many of them in different capacities, whether it was in the Senate uh, or as uh, presiding over the, the Senate. Um, seeing some of them go is, uh, is uh, bittersweet. You know, I hope the best for them. Uh, they put in a lot of years, uh, many of them. And um, again, their institutional knowledge and their inner, um, understanding of the inner workings of the legislature are going to be missed. But, you know, as well, uh, bringing uh, new faces uh, is, uh, is good as well, different perspectives. So we'll, uh, if I'm successful in, in uh, being reelected, we will work with them and uh, trying to find areas where we have common ground. D Dr. Levine, you mentioned a series of steps parents should take should they uh, be unable to find formula for their kids. And I'm, I'm wondering, are you aware of any families that have exhausted those steps and still not been able to come up with any formula? And is there any plan to create some sort of like, I don't know, strategic reserve or baby formula so that the state can step in when people are truly hard up? Yeah, so at the state level, I'm not aware of the dire circumstance that you just outlined. Though I, I like others, have seen on the national news um, some desperation. What we've noticed um, is that around the country, it all depends on where you are. Uh, it's not a consistent theme in every town and in every community, everywhere in every state. But the consistency is there's a shortage, but some are affected more than others. Uh, so at the moment, um, we don't believe there's anyone in Vermont who is at that point of desperation. Um, but obviously, we're in tune with what's going on and we'll intervene as needed. We did uh, discuss this uh, during a staff meeting this morning. And um, for anyone out there who is having difficulties finding formula, uh, give the health department a call or give us a call at 828-3333. Uh, we're working across uh, different agencies to see if we can develop some sort of an inventory uh, so we know uh, what's out there and where you can uh, where you can get it because there there are certain uh, niche places uh, where you may not have considered that have formula. So we are going to reach out and trying to develop some sort of a list, working with the health department in order to accomplish that. So give us a call again eight two eight three 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 and we'll point you in the right direction or we'll have some information for you. But we're developing that as we speak. Not securing an inventory. No, yourself, not, not no, just find out where it is. Uh, and uh, because, as Dr. Levine said, we don't think uh, we are at that point of, uh, of being highly concerned in the state at this point in time. Uh, but we want to make sure that uh, in certain areas there might be uh, further need than others. Uh, and we just want to be able to, to point them in the right direction so they can find the formula that they need. Dr. Levine, you need some warnings to It's mostly a cautionary thing, absolutely. Um, and I, I'm sure there's been more connection between 
parents and their pediatricians offices because this is a stressful time so they're getting a lot of guidance as well um, and uh, the pediatricians um, national organization uh, is putting out helpful uh, media reminders for parents as well but you know the problem with this of course is there's plenty of things we can tell parents not to do um, and at a time of shortage as the governor was alluding to uh, we try to be helpful in directing them to where they can find this valuable commodity um, but it's very hard to tell them something proactive they can do in terms of uh, the formula itself uh, except to not mess with it too much and use only something that's really going to be beneficial and not in any way harmful to your child. Governor, I want to get back to the legislative session briefly. There's a number of bills that are on their way to your desk, but one of the more significant ones, the tax policy package, with the military exemptions and, and others, what, what, were, what are your thoughts on, on where some of those policies or proposals landed? Yeah, well, I like tax relief, um, obviously, in any form. Um, I think we could have done better. I think we could have been broader, as I had said previously in different uh, press briefings. Um, but in the end, we have a tax package that gives relief to certain populations. And uh, so, uh, barring any technicality uh, that we haven't seen, uh, I'll be signing that. As we, we end this biennium, and um, you know, we've been working with the speaker and the pro tem over the past two years, how, how would you describe the, the, I'll say the nature of the relationship, but the, the ability that you, to, to work together? I mean, how, how would you characterize that over the past two years through the pandemic? Yeah, you know, it's just, there's no playbook on this, right? We're all, we're impacted, especially the legislature, in terms of, uh, legislating via Zoom, uh, which has been unprecedented. And uh, it took, I think, a, a bit, uh, especially in this uh, second half of the biennium, uh, to get back together, um, because I think we missed a lot. And, and it's no, no fault of the legislature. It's just the way the situation we found ourselves in. Um, but it left a lot of the public out, I believe. And it left a lot of the camaraderie that happens, the talking amongst members and senators, uh, amongst themselves in the hallway and so forth, uh, to, to talk through some of the situations that were coming before them. It also um, prevented us from having that relationship in the hallways and other places with individual members. So, you know, I, I don't think it, uh, it helped the legislative process, but we got through it. And that's the important part, and uh, came to agreement in the end. Uh, but, um, but I would say, I mean, I was uh, speaking with them at least every other week. Uh, the speaker and the pro tem, uh, we'd uh, alternate. So I was speaking to one of them every week, and and we were we had very cordial discussions and uh, very uh, honest and open discussions. So um, that. I thought uh, I thought things worked through as best as they could under the circumstances. Your plan for the universal school meals bill? Um, uh, uh, your plan for the universal school meals bill? Still looking at that, uh, but um, but that will again be signed unless there's some technical problems with the bill. As I said, um, the universal meals. I had uh, some hesitation. Uh, and I voiced that uh, during the discussion. Uh, I thought uh, we should just go with uh, universal breakfast um, because of the price tag. And, uh, and I thought it was somewhat perverse to think uh, in the future that we would have people who are more vulnerable, um, that uh, don't have the financial means, were actually going to be impacted by paying for those uh, more affluent families to have, have uh, universal meals. Uh, so I still feel that's the case. I'm concerned about where we're going to fill the gap in the future, um, what, um, what tax proposal uh, they may come up with uh, in order to do that. Uh, but we're using surplus dollars, one-time surplus dollars uh, this year uh, to, to, again, for the third year, 
with FEMA funding in the past or, or federal funding in the past two years uh, will fulfill our um, what some feels an obligation to move forward throughout this year uh, with the universal meals and uh, but we're going to have to have the tough conversations in the future is how do we afford all that we're spending on I mean we we're, we're spending at a, at a very fast rate with one-time money and uh, so next year with again inflation possibly a recession um, that's when some of the tough decisions will have to be made so so fair to say you don't anticipate this program uh, being reflected as a priority in your budget proposal it, in not in in that form not as a universal um, plan but again um, we want to I want to make sure that we are helping those families who can't afford to feed their kids. I believe it's important uh, for them uh, to have, have uh, funding uh, so that we can supplement funding. And I think we've done that in the past with some federal help and we'll continue to draw down federal funding in order to do that. But we'll see. Um, again, some have made um, the argument on both sides of the aisle that uh, maybe a universal meal program, just breakfasts, uh, to get the kids started out in the day uh, with, uh, with everyone receiving the same thing uh, would be beneficial. But, but again, we'll see what happens in the future. Governor, Summer also, uh, you may have heard, um, floating the, the idea of uh, building a new bridge between uh, Grand Isle and, and Plattsburgh. Is, is this something that you need or something that you support? That may be more of a, of a want than a need. Um, I think we have higher priorities in the state, but if New York wants to build a bridge uh, between New York and Vermont, they can have at it. And they can pay for it, too. Should we expect any other details at this point? You I, th I think you should expect uh, there may be. Um, we, haven't, we only have uh, seven bills right now. There's probably 70 total that are coming our way at some point. Um, Many of them were rushed through at the end. Uh, I think people should expect to see more. I, I can't tell you which ones, but there are some bills uh, that I have concerns about. Um, there are many I talked about uh, during the session. Uh, so I think they'll be coming in at rapid pace, and uh, you'll know about them fairly soon uh, because we have to get through them once they, once they get to us. Uh, we have uh, five days uh, to, to sign or, or veto. Is, is it fair to say, though, that you have, you've already made a decision that you're no. going to veto that Act 250? Oh, Act 250, yes. Okay. Yeah, that one. You can take that one to the bank. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We should do that. All right. We'll move on to the phones. Starting with Greg Lamro, County Courier. Greg Lamoureux. All right, we'll try Tim McQuisden, Vermont Business Magazine. Hey, Governor, the revenue report came in last, late last week, and it was another sort of a whopping return on the personal income tax. How is that going to affect uh, that, how you look at the, the state finances going forward into next legislative season? Yeah, I think we'll have to. To see if this is um, if this is consistent, um, if we repeat this, we'll have to wait for the next quarter uh, to make any decisions uh, in regards to that. I mean, it's it's good news in some respects, but we know that inflation has driven uh, a lot of the the costs. Uh, labor costs are, have been increased uh, because of the demand and shortage of uh, of the workforce. So that's driving a lot of the personal income as well. The uh, consumption taxes came in pretty well, which sort of reflect well on the economy right now, but the, the transportation numbers, again, are, are problematic. Do you, do you think there's going to have to be um, some structural changes with the, the T-Fund going forward? Well, I do uh, think there's going to have to be structural changes in the future uh, because we are going to be um, moving towards electrification, and uh, so we aren't going to be able to count on the per gallon tax, fuel taxes, uh, to uh, to fund the T T uh, T bill. So, 
um, there's going to be a natural progression to something else. But I think we're all faced with this uh, federally as well. So um, hopefully the, the federal government will take the lead on this. Congress will act and uh, because they're tied to this as much as we are. Okay, great, thank you. Guy Page, Vermont Daily Chronicle. Governor, the shooting in Buffalo has raised questions in the minds of many about, uh, first of all, whether our Vermont schools, uh, which have a, a growing problem with mental health, that much has been acknowledged, whether we are flagging potential problems like this, uh, this disturbed, uh, alleged disturbed young killer in Buffalo. Uh, are we doing enough to, to identify potential problems and prevent something like this from happening? Uh, that's, that's the first part of the question. Uh, the second is, you know, here in Vermont, we have our own problems, growing crime problems, as you acknowledged last week. Uh, seems like there's a, there are shootings almost, almost daily. Well, not quite, but almost daily. And what, what are we doing on a state level to uh, address these, these problems, uh, many of them drug-related? Um, obviously uh, concerned uh, with what we're seeing across the country uh, here in Vermont as well in terms of gun violence and, and some of the violence we're seeing, um, the systemic racism, white supremacy, uh, some of these uh, uh, extreme groups, extremist groups um, that are infiltrating uh, some of our communities. And so we are always keeping a watchful eye, um, but um, but I'm still concerned. I'm always concerned. Uh, it's what keeps me up at night. Um, so uh, I have great faith in our team at Public Safety and throughout uh, that we're, again, keeping a watchful eye, but we can't see everything. So I would say uh, to Vermonters, if you see something, say something. Um, we saw that in Fairhaven a number of years ago. And uh, if it wasn't for someone coming forward, I think we would have had um, a, a, a incredible, horrific act uh, happen. Um, he would have gone. It wasn't a question of which day, or, or it was just a question. It wasn't a question of if. It was a question of which day. And um, so, we need that information. We need you to keep feeding us that information. If you see something, say something. Uh, I might ask uh, Commissioner Sherling if he has anything to add from his perspective. Uh, thanks, Governor. A I'll, I'll lot to unpack in that question. Um, there have been uh, approximately 47 unrelated incidents, um, not including pounds of, uh, of shots being fired in, in Vermont so far this year. Those range from firearm homicides to three. Uh, shootings with non-lethal injuries, there's been eight so far, um, 25 incidents in which firearms were fired, uh, and another 11 where property was struck um, by, uh, by bullets. Um, so, um, you know, we, as we talked about last week, we remain concerned about that. In terms of schools, uh, we have a robust school safety program um, run by uh, local and uh, county and state law enforcement in conjunction with the Agency of Education and the uh, Division of Emergency Management and uh, lots of school safety plans in place and, uh, and, and resources that go into both early identification of potential problems and interventions um, when necessary. Uh, and then the, the final piece, um, uh, as the governor observed, um, a large cross-section of the firearm-related incidents uh, statewide are drug-related there are robust efforts in drug interdiction uh, on a federal, state, and local level. Uh, large operation uh, that was publicized uh, last week to try to do uh, interdiction in a particular community. Um, treatment that uh, the Department of Health uh, is spearheading for those with addiction. It does seem that um, those uh, efforts, uh, while making some ground in some areas, uh, you know, are swimming upstream against a, a flood of opiates and 
uh, and related substances. So there's a lot more work to be done. Um, and uh, as, as we highlighted last week and the governor emphasized this a few minutes ago, uh, cooperation and, and uh, by witnesses to events in particular, uh, but also people uh, calling with uh, early uh, warnings around um, whether it's odd behavior, uh, street level drug dealing, uh, houses where there are a significant amount of uh, short duration foot traffic, things of that nature are all helpful to the overall effort. Well, Go Governor let me, and let me just Commissioner see. Sherling, thank you very much for that answer. Um, I follow up question. Uh, you mentioned a flood of opiates. Uh, there have been a flood of opiates over the southern border. And Governor, I wonder if you would be willing to uh, sort of go on the record as saying that the Biden administration has not done such a great job in stopping the, the flow of uh, opiates across the southern border. Uh, we're seeing uh, fentanyl is the is the issue I think at this point in time and it's not just coming from the southern border although I acknowledge uh, a, a great deal of it is coming from there uh, but coming from China as well and other places um, and it's uh, relatively inexpensive um, and is being um, manufactured even in within the in the country so uh, that's a huge concern, um, and I think that it's, uh, the, you know, the, the Biden administration uh, has to do a better job in, in trying to um, stop the illicit uh, uh, migration of, of the illicit drug into the country from all standpoints. Uh, and I think Congress needs to act as well. So we're all in this together. I think we should have that common goal of, uh, of preventing uh, some of what we're seeing. Uh, this isn't going away. It's not getting better. Uh, the pandemic uh, has made the, the, the situation even worse, and um, we have a tough road ahead of us. I will also, I will also say that uh, I'm concerned on a state level as well as uh, across the country in terms of the workforce, uh, and that goes uh, it's across all sectors, uh, and that goes for law enforcement as well. And we're, um, you know, we're aging. Or a lot of our uh, law enforcement uh, are retiring, um, and we aren't getting as many coming in uh, as we hope, and to get the training necessary training in order to protect Vermonters. So uh, that's going to be uh, another uh, level of of, uh, of effort that we are going to have to to continue to work on uh, because. Um, we have a, an obligation uh, to protect Vermonters. Public safety is one of the highest uh, priorities of any government, and, uh, and we need to, to look there. Even dispatchers are becoming more and more difficult to fill. So across the board, um, this uh, workforce challenge is impacting every single sector, and that includes public safety. Thank you. Kevin McCallum, seven days. Governor, can you hear me okay? I can. Great. Um, I have a couple questions for you and then just one short one for Dr. Kilavine. Um Governor, you mentioned uh, early in your remarks that uh, you didn't get everything you wanted out of the legislative session. Can you just give us a couple of uh, items that uh, didn't, uh, didn't come your way? Military pensions, Act 250, more tax relief. Okay, that's helpful. Um, you mentioned uh, in your discussion about the meals, a concern about funding a gap um, in the future. And I wonder, and I understand that, right? That, that you don't want to um, move forward with a program that's gonna burden the state with a, with a large, large expenses going forward that you can't afford. Um, and I wonder how you feel about the rental registry bill because the rental registry bill is something that you objected to the rental registry, but that would have paid for the program and the bill now proposes to go forward with the program without the mechanism to pay for it. So I wonder if you have a similar concern about that inspection program now that it doesn't have a funding source. Yeah, I think we're, we're talking about apples and oranges. Um, the rental registry was $200 uh, or no, it, it was $45, I think per unit or something like that. 
uh, and that would have, have. Yeah, that would have paid uh, for uh, the the program extra fees that would have been passed on to to, to tenants um, because it wasn't going to be absorbed by the um, by those who owned uh, the the houses and and um, and uh, rental units. Um, so we had thought uh, all along uh, that we could we, we would be able to use some of the general fund uh, in order to accomplish uh, what they had set out to do and for those uh, communities that couldn't do their own inspections uh, that uh, the public safety would be able to do that with the funding out of the general fund so we were able to accomplish that my concern with again with the um, with the universal meals is that we are going to be asking those, uh, depending on what tax you use, the consumption tax, taxes or, or something uh, that would, could possibly impact the very people we're trying to protect in order to provide uh, meals for more affluent families. And that just doesn't seem fair to me. Uh, I think, okay, I understand that distinction. I guess my question more is, um, aren't you, if you sign the bill, if you sign, if you sign, you know, 210, wouldn't you essentially be signing up for a statewide rental registry inspection program that does not have a long-term source of funding for it? You'd no. be spending one-time money to set up a, a, a larger government bureaucracy. There's, there's no rental registry uh, in the bill. Uh, at this point right. in time, it provides it provides for uh, fire safety to inspect as needed. So that's not a rental registry. Um, and again, we're talking about um, maybe a million dollars a year versus thirty million dollars a year for the mm -hmm. universal meals. Okay, I understand. All right, so uh, one more question then. Um, you mentioned. Uh, that the pandemic in speaking with and building relationships with the legislature has sort of contributed to some of the difficulty that you've been in close contact with legislative leaders, but that, you know, some of the personal opportunities for personal conversation to work out differences were, were, were limited um, in part by the pandemic. I think legislative leaders have also used the phrase moving the goalposts. Uh, um, a lot to describe their relationship with your administration on a lot of key bills. They feel as though often the conversations with your administration about bills have not been either forthright or have shifted over the course of the legislative session. And I just wanted to give you an opportunity to respond to that. Yeah, well, I disagree. Um, I think I've been very clear about my objections in many of the bills. And I would say communication has been part of the problem, but I would say some of that communication is on their part. Um, for instance, the pension bill. Um, I would think once they came to agreement that they might have come to me and said, Governor, what do you think about this agreement uh, that we have with the unions? We've been handling these. What do, you, what do you think about this? Is this something you can get behind? And we didn't, we didn't have that conversation. They never came and uh, presented that to me. We had to learn about it through um, Ledge Council. So again, communication is a two-way street. Um, I don't think I moved any goalposts. Uh, I heard uh, some of uh, them saying that they satisfied my concerns uh, with, the, uh, with the clean heat standard, for instance, uh, by having a check back provision. Well, again, um, you don't know that you whether you satisfied my concerns unless you talk to me about that and present is exactly what you're thinking. Um, when we were presented with that after they proclaimed that uh, they satisfied all my concerns, um, it didn't satisfy all my concerns after reading it. So again, that could have been prevented. Uh, we could have done things differently. Uh, but in the, I think in the end, uh, we will come up with, we've done this before and other pieces of legislation over the years I think we'll have a better approach uh, to this clean heat standard uh, than what was presented today. I don't think anybody was happy with the end product for different reasons. So I think we'll have something better and we'll work on that over the, uh, the summer uh, to present something to the legislature. Okay, great, thanks. And then my, my question for Dr. Levine is very simple. In, in one instance, he mentioned that the testing sites would be closing in May 
And then in another instance, he mentioned that people can continue to pick up testing kits at testing sites through June. Can you just clarify that, please, Doctor? Sure. <clears throat> process is being organized and developing in May, but most of these sites will be uh, phased out during the month of June. People who want to uh, take advantage of getting the free tests from the sites, if they go to the registration site on healthvermont.gov, uh, as they would normally do, uh, they'll be able to actually set up an appointment to pick that up so they'll know the dates that are available to them during this time frame. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, both of you. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. For their kids, and do you recommend uh, the booster uh, for five to eleven year olds? Is it is it necessary given the, the state of the virus in Vermont? Now? Lots of good questions. So this, you know, as as so so often has happened during this pandemic, this news comes out, you know, as we're preparing to walk into the auditorium. So haven't read all of the uh, materials that the FDA has put out in their release. Um, as you point out, this will go to the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practice, which advises the CDC. And I suspect before the end of the week, we will hear from them regarding um, their recommendation, which is really what the clinical practice community will use to uh, make decisions. When it comes to the 5 to 11-year-old, <clears throat> I again have to congratulate Vermonters, though. We're at about a 56% rate of uh, these kids getting uh, fully vaccinated at this point in time. Uh, that's probably double what the average is in the country. Still room to move, obviously. Um, so I'm much more concerned with getting the extra 44% of 5 to 11 year olds vaccinated um, than actually the need for a booster for the ones who already have. But I will weigh the data and the information that comes out this week and uh, be able to offer a firm recommendation once I've seen that. Um, certainly, you point out that with Omicron and the newer subvariants of Omicron, things have changed. Many, many uh, of these uh, eligible kids now have actually had the infection. Um, they. Um, are still eligible for a vaccine to enhance their amount of immunity. We all know that the outcomes in that age range are pretty much uniformly good uh, with uh, very uncommon exceptions around the country. And that in Vermont, we have had nobody hospitalized in an ICU that's of pediatric age um, for many months this year uh, since Omicron has been around. Certainly, we've had cases and we've had an occasional hospitalization for Omicron, not in the ICU, but most of what we're seeing is viruses other than SARS-CoV-2 virus impacting um, our, our pediatric population. We're also anticipating in the next couple of weeks what the FDA's decision will be regarding the under five age group. So more to come on that as well. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Um, uh, for Secretary French, uh, sticking with kids, um, there's uh, about a month until the end of the school year, and it's been a little over two months um, since uh, AOE and the Health Department shifted their school recommendations for mitigation guidelines. You, you had mentioned it was time for schools to get back to their principal task of educating. Um, curious if anything in the in these last two months um, has been gathered in terms of data and information 
about how uh, Vermont school children are doing, um, the academic impacts of the pandemic, sort of the, the gaps that need to be filled, um, and, and what is the work uh, for schools heading into summer in order to prepare for next school year? It, uh, it seems like there's probably a lot of bridges that still need to be built. Yeah, it's a great question, a lot there. Um, you know, certainly the focus right now to get through the rest of the school year on a celebratory note, uh, it's been a hard year in schools and, uh, you know, this wonderful weather we're having, it's just a great time of year in school. So I'm hopeful people take advantage of the normal opportunities to just celebrate the school year. Uh, we will be making an announcement shortly, um, positioning to what we call the recovery phase of our planning at the state level. Um, you're right, we do want to put a focus on academic learning loss and the social emotional needs of students. Um, you know, there's also a component on uh, the wellness initiative pertaining to staff. So all those things will be coming together more for the fall, but uh, we'll be making that announcement here shortly, uh, essentially just to um, start making that transition to leverage our federal dollars that have been reserved at the state level to make that impact at the local level. And um, this time is uh, a busy time for uh, hiring, um, uh, announcing of school positions, um, you know, retooling staff, things like that. What are you hearing from the superintendents and from, from folks at the school level about staffing concerns um, and, and having the personnel necessary uh, as they begin building their plans for next year? Yeah, it's a very real uh, challenging situation. We hear fairly regularly from folks from the difficulties of hiring, particularly some of the more acute areas like special education. Um, but, you know, it's not unique to education. You know, the hiring and workforce issues are across all sectors in our economy. Um, I think, you know, in education, it's, uh, it's been very challenging in the last couple of years, and uh, that certainly has made uh, recruitment more difficult. Um, but, you know, just the overall demographic challenges the workforce are playing themselves out in education and we'll have some work to do uh, to, to be uh, recruiting and retaining the staff in the schools. Okay, thank you. Aaron Patanko, BT Digger. Hello, um, I think these questions are for Dr. Levine. Um, I have some questions about the transition to this new kind of testing strategy. Um, I guess the first question would be kind of a practical one for people looking to do any kind of international travel. Many countries still require PCR testing specifically, whereas um, a lot of doctor's offices are you know, giving wait times or scheduling far in advance for non-essential kind of appointments. Um, is there a convenient place for people to find PCR tests within 72 hours of leaving on a flight? Yeah, <clears throat> if they can't find it within their own healthcare provider setting, I would say the pharmacy setting would be uh, able to accomplish that for them. PCR tests are widely available there. Okay, and is that kind of list of pharmacies that provide that part of what's on the Department of Health website? The list of pharmacies is I'll have to check and get back to you if it actually identifies um, the type of testing that's available. Okay. Um, I'm also wondering, um, you know, especially when you are testing positive for COVID-19 and you're trying to figure out whether you are still testing positive. You, people often test multiple times in a row, and that sounds like it can be potentially financially burdensome um, now that the state-run testing sites aren't giving away, um, you know, easily affordable antigen tests or lamp tests. So uh, what are the options for Vermonters who might struggle to afford antigen testing? Yeah, so for people who have uh, health insurance that usually covers the cost of up to eight take-home test kits per month and that includes commercial insurance that includes um, Medicaid you can show your insurance card at a pharmacy counter for people who are having trouble accessing testing we have been sending them uh, referring them to federally qualified 
health centers, free clinics, or some of our own Vermont Department of Health local health offices uh, to try to make uh, up for that gap in case they have trouble accessing uh, the tests that they need. So I think uh, all of that will continue. And um, there's also still the Biden administration's opportunities uh, through mail to get test kits uh, for them as well. You prefaced your question, though, with an interesting thought. Um, many people are repetitively testing themselves once they know they're positive. Um, and I would submit that they're probably going a little overboard, some of them, on that. Um, because there really should not be a need to continue to test yourself day by day by day um, if you're feeling completely well and have resolved your symptoms. We don't know as much about the correlation between a positive antigen test seven days in in a person feeling completely well and their ability to infect others. But suffice it to say, there are lots of people who are mingling in society who don't feel poorly and may actually be an asymptomatic person and have uh, the ability to infect others too. So I would hate for people to keep testing themselves day by day by day and suddenly they've done five or six tests um, even though they're feeling much better at that point in time. Um, that's, that's probably not a good strategy and will utilize their free tests and then they'd end up having to find more. Does the Department of Health still recommend that people test negative uh, before getting out of quarantine? You mean isolation? Yeah, sorry, isolation. Yeah, uh, so that, that recommendation is no longer uh, on our website. If your okay. five days has elapsed and you have no symptoms and you're feeling quite well, day six is your day of freedom. Okay. Um, we're also hearing about some potential issues with hospital capacity in Rutland. Specifically, they've reopened their COVID unit and have already filled that COVID unit up. Does that, um, well, I guess, first off, um, you know, is the, is the state doing anything to support the health system in Rutland right now? And does that give you any pause in these decisions to close down certain testing or draw down and to end um, you know, the data dashboard and some of your data processes? Uh, no, that doesn't give me pause. We are actually really watching the healthcare system very closely, as you're aware. Um, we have seen a sort of stabilization in the trends uh, that we're watching closely across the system. I haven't talked to Rutland as of late um, to understand exactly why they've done what they've done. Um, no other hospital has really um, made that pivot. Most days we have a sort of yellow, uh, green, yellow, orange, red, black system for varying degrees of severity of uh, stress on a particular institution. And the majority are always in green and yellow. On an occasion there may be two in an orange state. So the bottom line is most of the healthcare system struggles when they're having them lately are from absenteeism of staff related to illness, like we've seen in other sectors. And as those um, improve, because there's less people who uh, have to be out because the infection has completed its course there, um, the hospitals have less trouble. So I have to find out if Rutland is having staffing issues or if it's actually a concern about patients. Our seven-day yeah, well, seven average for people in the hospital for COVID reasons is 5% of all hospital beds, uh, which is a very low number. And then yeah, I, I was just going to note that um, the CDC says that Rutland has among the highest in the state right now in terms of recent COVID admissions. Yeah, so no, that may be. Perhaps. Yeah. Uh, that's all for me. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Jason. Sorry, Governor, I was hoping to get a gold star today, but I do have a couple of questions. Um, 
<clears throat> the the uh, first one is now that you've made the decision to run for re-election, um, are there specific things that you're planning on focusing on and working on until the next legislative sex, uh, session? Uh, do they change? And if so, which ones and how? Uh, they don't change. Um, again, we have a lot on our plate at this point in time uh, with all the issues that we're faced with. Uh, again, going back, you know, growing the economy, making Vermont more affordable, protect the most vulnerable. Uh, those are the things that we, we focus on every single day. And uh, trying to put this money into uh, uh, this investment money, uh, ARPA money in particular, uh, into play uh, so that uh, we get the best return on investment is something that we're going to be focus focusing on. So there's a lot going on in this space. And uh, we'll uh, we'll continue to do our, our work and the job at hand. I was disappointed. I thought you were going to start uh, an electric uh, snowmobile racing tour across the I, I guess that'll happen. If that if that happens, I'll be a part of it. <laughs> uh, last question is: um, If you drive around the back roads of Vermont, all over the place these days, <clears throat> you can't help but notice more and more people have adopted. Uh, Elon Musk's Starlink system for their uh, internet in rural areas, seeing people use very creative ways to get the dish in a place where they can actually get a good focus on satellites. Um, and they seem, when they have the availability to be able to deliver high speed in rural areas much faster than any of the other plans we have in place, do you see that as an, uh, an option that could be added as we go forward in the process of trying to give broadband to rural areas? Yeah, I do. Um, I think that that, um, that service is going to continue to expand and uh, become more prevalent and uh, be improved. So uh, I think that this could be part of the mix in the future, especially for, again, those last mile type of situations. Okay, thanks very much, that's all I have. I did want to add three more to the, to the issues that I didn't get. Um, I think I was thinking about the uh, construction technical education infrastructure money. Uh, there was 50 million that uh, I proposed that did not get funded. Um, as well, um, the uh, sports betting uh, wasn't taken up. Uh, that was a, another uh, issue that uh, I thought would be helpful. The third was um, there was absolutely no interest in the legislature uh, to expand cell service. Uh, we had $50 million in for that, and that was not uh, taken up. So uh, those are three more. I'm, I'm sure I'll come up with three more uh, by next week if you want to ask again.